I mean, I tell you what, just a little bit of rain, a little cooler weather. A month ago, we were, three weeks ago, we were just dying, right? Even two weeks ago, it was two weeks ago was the hottest uh, I think we've ever had. Wasn't it 116 one day in Sacramento? Let's forget about it. Just forget about it. Let's go on and have some, some good fall. It's time. Hey, you guys, it is good to be back. Uh, Lori and I were not together last week. You got to hear the real preacher in the family last week, and that's my wife, Lori, and uh, she, I listened to the whole message, and it was fabulous, honey. Thank you so much for sharing your heart there, but um, I was back in the Midwest. Michelle went along with me. I dropped her off in Michigan to visit her, her dad and just pray for him. Uh, you know, he needs prayer at this time of his life. But she got to visit family. I took off and did a 2,000-mile crazy six-day whirlwind trip. And uh, I guess Lori told you I was supposed to fill you in on one part of the trip. I got to see lots of family and friends and had two reunions. A uh, high school reunion a week ago Saturday night for my, my class. It was 75. They did a, kind of a weird year. It was, it was 47th year for me. But... They did a combined class of 75, 76, 77 class reunion. And uh, it, it was pretty amazing because the year I graduated high school, now you, you may, if you don't understand the state of Indiana and basketball, uh, this may not mean so much to you, but back then in Indiana, there were no graded schools. So every high school in Indiana was competing for one trophy. And you can imagine that's what created that thing called Hoosier Hysteria, where every single little farm community had a team of players that were just amazing back then. And there's even a movie called Hoosiers that was written about it. But in 1975, my graduating year, our team was starting to do pretty well that year, and we were in the sectional playoffs. So I'll just take you back and tell you a little quick story. We were in sectional playoffs. I was a pretty new Christian, not really making mature decisions all the time at 17. But I remember uh, I was desperate because in the sectional playoffs, our team was down four points with three seconds left on the clock. Four points needed with three seconds left on the clock. I mean, this is cardiac arrest stuff, right? And we, we were just down, and I was sitting there. I was desperate. Uh, we were emotional, and I made a bargain with God. Not a good idea, but I did it as a young man. And so I said, Lord, if you'll just let us win this game, if you, we can win this game against Oak Hill, before the end of my senior year this year, I will witness, I will tell all five starters on the team about you. Guess what happened? We won. <laughs> the game was won. It was unbelievable. I won't even go into the detail. It was just a, one of those unbelievable games. We went on and won the regionals. We went on and won semi-state, and that year... Our high school won the Indiana State Championship for basketball. That was a big deal back then, and it was my senior year. And I forgot or made excuses. I remember at graduated, graduation thinking, this is my last chance to tell these starting five about you, Jesus. So if you'll send them to me, I'll tell them. <laughs> it didn't happen. And I, I kind of, you know, over the years had little tinges of guilt over that, but for the most part forgot about it until about two weeks ago. About two weeks ago, I'm looking through the high school yearbook to kind of renew myself on people's faces. Not that that would help that much. Uh, the whole thing at a high school reunion at that time is, just, is who can figure out who, who the other person is. But as I'm going through this process, I come across a picture of the starting five, the big win at the state championship, and God taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, Mark, 
Remember that promise you made to me? Well, Lord, I guess I do. <laughs> Thanks for bringing it back to my attention. Anyway, um, I contact my brother-in-law, Mike Mills. He's created a couple of really great uh, bottom-line tracks with gospel information in it, how a person can know for sure they go to heaven when they die. And I started praying. I shared it with a few people. We started praying, Lori and I did, that I would get an entree to any of the starting five that happened to be at the reunion. There were three of the starting five there. They were, they were recognized. Also, a music group I was, rec in was recognized because I was in the, that year we won a competition that actually became a movement called the show choir movement in high schools. And so I was in the very first high school show choir in America, historic, that same year. Um, and so that we were honored. I got to MC that, so it was a refresher for these ball players of who I was. And then God ushered me in to talk to all three of them. There were two missing. But you guys, I can't tell you how important it is to do what God, what, do what you say you'll do for the Lord. God gave me a beautiful entree. I was able to talk to all three of them. Two of those guys have already gotten saved. They were very involved in their churches. They thanked me for coming. They couldn't believe it. One of them said, now I know why I was supposed to come here because this story has inspired the life out of me. I'm just so excited. And then the third one uh, had not professed faith in Christ and uh, was very open and thanked me. And he said, I ran into one. One kid in high school that witnessed to me, and he, he would really live the life. He goes, I'm going to take this brochure, and I'm going to read it and pay attention to it. And I said, if, if anything happens, just let me know. But it, you know, Connor, but honestly, um, it's more embarrassing to me than anything because it took me 47 and a half years to do what I said I would do. And there's still two guys left out, so I'm praying for a way to get to them. But the important thing is that our life is so short, and what we do really matters. What we do with our life matters, and it doesn't just matter for us. It matters for everybody else in our circle, everybody else in our sphere, as they call it. What are you going to do to get the most out of life? And I'm praying that, that that message will get through to my friend, um, that one guy that has not professed faith. His wife is a believer. I believe God is going to start working on that with him. But today, I just want to talk to you about how you can develop a life of trust in the Lord so that you can get the most out of life that's possible. So there are four myths about God. I don't know if you guys are aware of these. Uh, and, and you know what, you guys? I just somehow got the wrong note. So can you give me just a second? I got to go back and get the right one so I don't give next week's message. Okay. How to get the most life. And today we're going to talk about basing your life on the truth. Basing your whole life on the truth. And here is a myth. Maybe you've heard this myth before, and it's funny, Lori mentioned the same myth last week. The myth is, in America, that's full of pluralism and this idea that all religions are equal and all are the same and all lead to the same place. The myth is, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Keep the faith, brother. The faith in what? Pluralism is the reigning religion of our day especially in our state, especially on the West Coast, where we can mix a little bit of this and a little bit of that and take a little bit of Eastern mysticism and a little bit of, you know, Hinduism and a little bit of Christianity and, and mix it into a New Age kind of concoction. And we can kind of figure out our own way. We can figure out happiness and the way to nirvana or whatever it is that people are looking for. But pluralism will lead people to the wrong place. Do you guys remember the story of John F. Kennedy Jr.? 
You know, it's a sad story because, man, talk about a handsome guy. A guy that had everything going for him. He was up and running. I think a lot of people thought, man, this guy someday could be the president of the United States, just like his dad, right? And John F. Kennedy was talented, had a beautiful family, and then we got the news several years back that he had died in a plane crash just off of Martha's Vineyard. His plane had crashed into the ocean, and everybody on board had perished, including him. You remember the story? You guys aware of this? Well, it turns out that John F. Kennedy didn't know how to fly with instruments. He was used to flying by sight lines and light and so forth, but he had gotten out over the ocean, and he didn't quite know how to read his instruments. And so there is latitude. There, in an airplane, you're, you're trying to figure out how to keep uh, two things. I forget what they're called. A pilot amongst us? But anyway, he had set the autopilot or, or the trajectory at a slight pitch downward instead of straight. He, he didn't really know how to read the instruments properly in his plane. And so gradually, very gradually, his airplane was headed towards the water instead of flat on the horizon. Gradually. And of course, eventually, before he got to land, he crashed into the water, and everybody died. And I want to tell you guys, the most dangerous beliefs are the ones that come closest to the truth. You know, if you see a guy on an archery course shooting the arrows backwards, everybody knows they're nuts. But it's the guys that are shooting just slightly off that could be the most dangerous. And they're the ones, unfortunately, that are missing the mark, even though they think they're headed the right direction with their arrow. I'm going to ask you guys a question today. What do you believe? What are your beliefs? What are you basing your life on? And we're going to take a look at this today because there's some facts about beliefs you need to know. Here's the first one. My beliefs are my choice. A lot of people don't think this is true. They think they can blame everybody else for their beliefs. They can blame their parents because their parents forced them to go to church. They can blame this person or that person for the beliefs they hold in their life. But the Bible says that everybody has their own beliefs and their own decisions to make about what they believe. In fact, in Romans 1.21, it says this. Yes, they knew God. But they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. It goes on to say, then after a while, God turns them over to a reprobate mind is the way that it's put in the King James. And we've got a lot of reprobate minds running around the world today. Would you agree? Because they haven't give God, given God the glory as the creator. They believe that we're all just a big accident and they can make it up for themselves. But it always leads to the wrong place. Here's the second truth. My beliefs determine my behavior. Oh, yes, they do. I'm going to tell you one thing. This young man back here would not be a great football player if he was convinced in his mind he couldn't do it. If he believed, oh, I could never do it, he would never be able to. The moment you set your mind on a belief, it determines the behaviors that you practice in your life. And then they're perpetual. The bad behavior perpetuates bad belief and so on and so forth. Negative thinking, negative action, negative thinking, negative action. It gets people into ruts. Proverbs 4.23 says this, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. Lori likes it in the old King James because it says, uh, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. Everything in your life, all the decisions you make spring from your beliefs. In fact, your beliefs are so strong that even if your language is nasty, God says, Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Your beliefs determine what you say, how you act, the things you do, and the negativity that comes into your life, or just the opposite. So here's the problem. 
if my beliefs are wrong, I'm going to find crookedness in my actions and in my life. And eventually, that's going to turn into all kinds of big issues, big problems. Here's number three, third, third fact. The world has taught me many false beliefs. Okay. The average kid in America, if I have the stats right in my memory, I believe I do, receives 18 hours of television a week. 18 hours of this tube telling me what to believe. Do you guys understand this? You understand it, right? You're watching the tube. I do it too. But after years and years and years of instruction from the television, who is really teaching us the truth? What are we really taking in that is going to even check the truth? What are we going to do? And the average child has about five to ten minutes a week of real interaction with their parents. Think about it. They're impacted more by their teachers, by their classmates, and by media than they are by even their own parents. It's pretty powerful to think about, isn't it? And religious instruction has gone to an all-time low. You can add to that that for most kids, there's zero spiritual input. Zero spiritual input into their minds and what they believe. And here are 10 myths from TV talk shows that may have gotten into you or TV shows that you've watched. Here's the first one. All your problems are somebody else's fault. You hear that all the time on TV. You hear it on the news especially. Somebody else is at fault for everything wrong in my life. Here's another one. The world owes you happiness. Listen, friend. The world doesn't owe you any happiness. Happiness and, and joy come from a different place, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Here's another one. You'll be happy if you just get what you want. That's not true. Because over and over, people get what they want, and it never satisfies that deeper desire and need in their life. Am I right? Right? Here's another one. There's never any reason to feel guilty. Oh, my goodness. That's, that, that is pervasive everywhere in media. Nah, you, this guilt thing, that's just false guilt. Enjoy your life. Do whatever you want. Here's another one. Man is basically good and unselfish. What planet are these people on? Man, if you can't see society crumbling, and I, I know we need to see the best in other people, but, but the truth is, if we think humanity is doing a good job of being good on its own, I think we all know no better than that. Here's another one. All beliefs are equally valid. We touched on that at the beginning. Here's another one. Perversion, pornography, those things are all innocent. Don't worry about them. Listen, our society is crumbling from the inside out with families falling apart because of perversion and the wrong view of sexuality. Here's another one. You can have it all. Just go for the gusto. Go for it. How about this one? You shouldn't have to wait for anything. You deserve, listen, you deserve to get the platinum card. You deserve to go a little further in debt. You probably do. Me too. The answer lies within you. That's a big one. And listen, I'm going to tell you this. Of all lies that Satan has, the biggest one is this one. The answer lies within you. You are really the God of your own life. There are certain truths that are really true that are attached to all these lies. You see, again, Satan's not interested in getting you to become a Satanist. He just wants to get you off track so that you don't really find the answer to life. Just a little bit off track is okay, even in a false religion that seems so basically good but doesn't have Christ at the center can get you even further off track. 2 Peter 2.2 2 says this, But there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. Look at this. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. 
Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. That's what's going on even in the church today, unfortunately, in many circles. So much falsehood couched as good. Here's a fourth truth about beliefs. Untrue beliefs, untrue beliefs are the cause of my emotional problems and unhappiness. Now listen to me. What you believe will determine your level of happiness and joy. It will. Because if you've got false beliefs that are leading your life into turmoil and confusion and a lack of peace, how can you possibly get happiness and joy? People are self-medicating today like they never have before. They're trying all kinds of ways, drugs or, or, or uh, anything, to, to find happiness that will last. But when you're filling your mind full of false beliefs... It's going to play out in the way you think and the way you act. I had a friend years ago uh, I was touring with on, on a, in a group. And my friend, at the time we were on the road, we were in a Christian singing group, but she was hooked on Stephen King novels. She was hooked on them. Every time you saw her, she was reading a Stephen King novel as we were traveling down the road. I didn't really even realize what the, the novels were because the movies hadn't really started coming out yet. That's how long it was. Maybe they hadn't invented movies yet. I don't know. It was so long ago. But, uh, but I, didn't really, I wasn't aware of who he was. But she just had a steady diet of Stephen King novels. Well, what that created in her, what, what do you think that, that kind of belief system would create in a person? Fear. Paranoia and fear. Well, one time we were on break from the road, and um, I had toured for several years, you know, and she was a part of the group I was in. And we were on break from a road, and she got invited to a, one of her cousin's house. They had bought a brand new house in North Carolina, and they said, Lynn, come, and here's the directions to get there. We didn't have GPS and all that back then. They just wrote out the directions. Take this turn, that turn, go two miles. There's our house. She didn't even know the address, but she went to their house, and she, they said, Lynn, tonight, just get a good night of rest. In the morning, we're going to be going to work. Just rest in. Here's the food. Just enjoy yourself. Well, she wakes up in the morning. Her cousins are gone. And she hears a scratching at her second floor window. And then she looks up at the window, and there is a hand, a man's hand, scratching at the window. Stephen King novels flood into her mind. <laughs> Can you just imagine it is coming, right? And she just, she just slunks off the bed and she, she crawls into this closet in her room and she keeps hearing this noise and then she hears them come into the house. She hears people in the house. She's thinking, I'm dead. These people are coming to get me. And she, and, and she finally, after a couple of hours of just sitting in there shaking in this closet, you can almost see the picture. She, she sneaks out and grabs the, the phone. By the way, back then, we had phones that you had to dial like this. If you're too young, it's, a, it's an antique now. You should go see one at a museum. But we had these phones, but she pulls this long cord phone into the closet, and she, she calls 911. And the person says, yes, can I help you? And she says, People are in my house. I'm staying with my cousin, and they're in the house, and they're coming to get me. And she says, what's the address? And she says, I don't know. There's no tracking on those phones. So she gives up on that after hours and hours of these people coming in and out of the house and staying in the closet all day. She finally hears familiar voices. It's afternoon. Her cousins have come home. She's been in the closet for eight hours. Her cousins come in, and she tells them, they came to get me. They were in here, and they go, oh, we forgot to tell you, Lynn. 
It was the painters. We forgot to tell you the painters were coming to paint the outside of the house today and some of the inside of the house. You know, anybody could have been caught in that, in that kind of fear. But for her, you guys, she was full of so much of that fear that she didn't even think any other possibility was true. How about you in your life? What's your belief system like? Do you believe God is a good God that can be trusted? Or do you think God is a selfish God who is out to get you? What do you think about God? What is your belief system based on? Have you founded it on TV or hearsay or, or what have you founded it on? Dr. Chris Thurman, he's one of the best known psychologists of last century in America, and he wrote this about what you believe. He, he said this, truth is the roadmap for negotiating the difficult challenges of life. Without it, we get lost and we develop emotional problems and that tell us we are lost. We often settle for half-truth or no truth at all because they are usually easier to believe. But truth is the only road to emotional help. Get this. Truth is the only road to emotional help. There is no other path. Now, the good news is that truth is available for er anyone who wants it, which also means that emotional help is possible for anyone. But the real question is, am I willing to pay the price? Am I willing to let real truth be my truth? Am I willing to put aside the things I've believed in all this time that may be false? The things that maybe my parents taught me, or my teachers taught me, or books taught me. Am I willing to go through the tough job of saying, God, I'm ready for real truth in my life, no matter what it may mean. No matter what changes it may have to make in my life. No matter what I need to do to receive it. Jesus says in John 8, 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What? You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You mean the truth isn't going to make me more paranoid, more scared, more like a slave? No. Jesus says, you will know the truth. I bring you that truth, and it's going to set you free. Freedom is not going to come quick if you've got years and years and years of false information in your heart and mind. You're going to have to have a renewal of the mind, but God wants to give that to you. Here's another fact about truth. The only source of absolute truth is God. The only source of absolute truth is God. It's a fundamental question whether you're a Christian, a non-Christian, somebody just checking it out or not, listening online and you're trying to figure out the journey, maybe you're Jewish or Buddhist, whatever you may be, here's what you've got to know. Something is going to have authority over your life. We are made with a God-shaped vacuum, and if you haven't let God fill the vacuum that's created it that is in his shape, you will have filled it with some other belief. Maybe it's the belief in evolution. Maybe it's the belief in uh, some other false religion. Whatever it may be, you will have allowed that thing to affect what you truly believe. What guidebook are you following? Because there's only one North Star, you know. If you're off on the North Star, you can't get true direction for your life. And God's Word is that North Star, you either have the world or the word telling you what to do. It can't be one or the other. It has to, I mean, it, can, it has to be one or the other. It can't be both and because the world is going to lead you astray. Romans 3, 4 says this. Even if everyone else is a liar, God is true. God never tells a lie. He will never mislead you. Even if what he tells you to do seems very harsh and hard to you right now, you will know by doing it that it is what is intended for your life to be the best it can possibly be. 
Jesus, what did Jesus say about that? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. And then John 10, 10, he says, the thief has come to rob, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. His truth is the only thing that can bring you joy and fulfillment and happiness, but it's not going to come easy, especially if you've been influenced by pop culture, television, all the media and educational systems that we've been filled with. Now listen, you guys, there, there are 73 million of us in America who are baby boomers. Raise your hand if you're in the crowd. Some of us are in the tribe and we understand each other. We are baby boomers. That means if you were born between 48 and 64, you're a baby boomer. And that entire generation, by the way, was bought, brought up, other than in the church itself and some, some of the, the cultures that some of us came up in, but the, the generation we were in was brought up on a book called The Baby Book by Dr. Spock. Anybody ever heard of that before? Dr. Spock, kind of a pop psychologist back in our day and came out with these new philosophies of child raising and you, never, you should never uh, spank a child. You should always just reason with them. They, they, they let them make their own decisions about religion. Let them decide what they want to believe. All of these, all of these things. And so many people of uh, baby boomers were influenced by that kind of teaching from his famous book, The Baby Book. In his 70s, Dr. Spock publicly held a press conference and said, oops, I was wrong. But it was too late. It was too late, and our world is permeated with people with false belief that it has wrecked their lives. They perpetuate the false beliefs, and then their children see them as hypocrites, and they go further away from the truth. Can you kind of see the crumbling of our society in the world today? Can you guys? I'm not a doom, a doom and gloomer today. I'm not trying to be, but I can see it. There's so much dysfunction, but God says he has a different way. God says that you can find fulfillment in life. You can be happy and joyful in life. You can find a way to find direction in your life. In Luke 21, 33, God says, heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. He says no matter who you are, no matter where you live, if you can discover the truth of my word and who I am and who Jesus is, it'll change your life. Hebrews 6.18 says, so God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Did you catch that? I love that verse. It is impossible for God to lie. There's no semblance of lying even in him. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence. I love this. Great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. We've got the real thing, you guys. If you're a believer in Jesus today, congratulate yourselves, not on, on doing it all right, but believing in the right thing. Thank God that you said yes to truth because it's God who rescues you, gives you an eternal hope Peace and joy and fulfillment. Here's fact number six today. I closed my notes, so let me find it again. Building my life on the foundation of God's truth is the key to emotional health and stability. Did you know that 80 times in Scripture, Jesus said, I tell you the truth? 20 times he said, you have heard it said, but I tell you the truth. One of those times is found in Matthew 7, and he tells the story of the man who built his house on sand and one who built his house on the rock. And he said, in both cases, the storms of life came. Great deluge and storm came and beat against the houses. The one on the sand with no foundation collapsed, but the one built on the rock lasted, made it through. Let me just ask you, 
a quick question today. Is your life built on solid truth or on sinking sand? Do you find yourself struggling with identity issues, questions about whether you can find fulfillment and happiness, wondering at night when you lay your head on your pillow where you go when you die? Every bit of that is answered in God's Word. Every single bit of it is there for you to discover the absolute truth, the absolute truth that God loves you, that He wants you to hold to Him as truth. If you are at a place today where you're kind of saying, oh man, I'm struggling, I'm struggling with it. I I may have some beliefs and some influence and some teaching that are not healthy for me. And I need to find the truth. I think today for believers, for us especially, it's a matter of, of affirming our trust in God and making a commitment to get into His Word. That's why it's so important, these ladies' Bible studies, the one that, that mom has and the one that, that is going to start up for the uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s group and anybody else that feels like they are, right? Those are so important Because when you dig into God's Word and start finding the truth, you can be set free. You can be set free from worry and anxiety and and concerns about where you go when you die. All of it is in the Word of God. Everything from the beginning of time to the end of man's being, everything between, and how you can have true life, true peace, true joy. I love that Jesus, when he is telling the story of the, the two men that built their house, the one on sand and one on the rock, he says, the one who builds house on the rock is the one who hears my word and puts it into practice. Your beliefs determine your behavior. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this amazing day. We want to thank you for the truth. We want to thank you, Lord, that by by digging into your word, the Bible, and by being around people who follow you and the influences and and sometimes just choosing to turn off, put that book down or turn off that TV or, or, or don't let the influences take over my mind, but instead base my whole life on your absolute truth in your word. That if I do that, Lord, I can truly find peace, joy, fulfillment, and an eternal life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all you've given me, all you've done for me. And now, believers, if you're here and you need to make an extra commitment to getting back into the Bible, we're so busy in life, but just saying, God, I need a little, a little bit of that food every day from your word, and I need to be in prayer so that I live my life based on your truth. If you need to make that commitment, just do it right where you are right now. You know what to do. Just confess your sin and tell God that you're sorry and ask him for his help to get back into his truth. Maybe you're here today listening in the house or listening online and you've never received Jesus as the Lord of truth in your life. Maybe maybe you've just been living life your way, confused, and you're looking for an answer and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now saying come to me Jesus says come to me and I will give you rest for your soul come to me and I'll give you eternal life come to me and I'll forgive your sins if you believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again the third day and with your mouth you'll confess him to be your Lord today he says you'll be saved that your sins will all be forgiven that you'll go to heaven when you die and that his Holy Spirit will come and abide in you and help you live according to the truth and find true joy and fulfillment and happiness in your life. If you'd like to receive Christ today, pray this prayer with me right now. Jesus, I believe in you today. I'm tired of living life my own way and in confusion. 
And today I'm ready to follow you as my Lord and Savior. I'm ready to turn my life over to you and put my trust in you for eternal life and to forgive all of my sins. I'm sorry for all the sins I've committed and ask you to forgive me and help me to follow you from this day forward. I receive you happily and joyfully, and I'm ready to have my life changed as you make me your child today. I pray it in Jesus' name. Now, my friends, before we look up and, and do anything like that, and still heads bowed, eyes closed, is there anybody here that says, you know, I heard this gospel message today, the message of salvation. I responded. I said, yes, Jesus, I want you in my life today. This is the first time you've invited Jesus to be your Savior. And you were born again today. And you want to raise your hand and let me know that. Anybody? Perhaps you're listening online and you made that choice. Let us know. Will you let us know of your decision so we can follow up and send you some helpful materials to help you grow and help you find a good church somewhere, either here or somewhere else, where you can grow in your new faith. Now, how about you believers? Heads up, heads bowed, eyes closed still. Any believer here that said, I made a new, fresh commitment today. I'm raising my hand and saying, I'm committed to getting back into the God's Word. I'm ready to get into prayer and God's Word to seek the truth. You want to raise your hand and let me know that? Anybody? Yeah, that's good. God bless. All right. God, you're so good to us. You're so good. We need you. We need your truth in our lives. Help us to find it and live according to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Seth and Sarah.